And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, the madman behind Vindicated Entertainment, the studio that in that insists that you crit different, <laughs> and, a, and a man who's no stranger to my temple, good old Vincent Baker coming back with Death Send, so <laughs> welcome back to the temple, man, how you doing? I'm doing great, glad to be back. As we talked earlier, this is my fifth time returning to the temple, so or my fifth time at the temple. I guess it's my fourth time returning. Mm -hmm. Happy to be back. And indeed, we uh, we have games that crit different. That is our slogan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw I saw I saw where you started to use that after one after one particular story that I'm not going to get into here. Uh, but I, uh, I, I'm not even exactly sure which one you're referring to, but we'll leave that to be a mystery because Death Send is all about mystery. So maybe someone can can solve this one and uh, let me know. <laughs> yeah. So this is a new this is a new ground for you. I I was gonna say that this is a new ground for you, but the, but in some ways it in some ways it isn't because you had kind of built a foundation with this particular sandbox through stuff like Legendaria. Would that that be, is correct. Would that yeah. be accurate? Yeah, that that is very accurate. Um, so for those that aren't familiar with Legendaria, it's a game that I made in 2019. And the whole idea is that it's essentially, it gives you a lot of elements of a tabletop role-playing game, but it's meant to be played through texting on your phone. So you don't actually have to be at the table with other players. You can, but you don't have to be. So you can either set up more like a traditional game where you're all playing at a table, or you can break it apart throughout the week and you send text messages to the game master who will then resolve your actions and the game is set up very much that way so people can play on their own schedules. The biggest difference is with that game it's very much about playing very legendary characters with these epic abilities and you end up having these like climactic showdowns where like you have these giant battles that take place and with Death Send it takes a similar the similar rule set, but it sort of modifies it to make it more about the cat and mouse mystery and in investigations, more of the thriller, a lot more Death Note inspired. So it's a lot more of mental games and trying to outsmart your your the other players than it is trying to have this giant battle. Mm -hmm. And the, now I will I will note a f I will note a few obvious bits bits of reference. One of them being the fact that the cover. I'm probably not reading too much in this, into this, but the cover keeps reminding me of the of, of the art for the Change of Heart spell card in Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah. No. So it's a. Uh... In hindsight, it's a bit of a weird choice, I think, for me, because the game itself has nothing to do with Yu-Gi-Oh, like, on its own. No, <laughs> but that, no I... that's Banished's job. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so I already have Banishment, which has the whole Yu-Gi-Oh! inspired thing, but I know, like, th this game does have, like, a sort of a dichotomy between, like, light and dark and, like, good and evil and, like, what's morality, mm -hmm. um, which are similar themes that you see upon, like, watching Death Note. So... I wanted to like play up on that when it came to the cover, and what just stood out in my mind was the Change of Heart Yu-Gi-Oh card, which, for those that know me, I'm a big fan of Yu-Gi-Oh, especially the more classic era Yu-Gi-Oh, and Change of Heart, I think, is one of the coolest cards that they've ever made, including its artwork, and so I just wanted to play uh, homage back to that, and so the cover for Death Sin definitely is doing that. It still boggles my mind that, ta that Takahashi never made, a TTRPG, never made a TTRPG book or did art for one. Ah oh, man, that would have been so good too. Like that would have been so cool to see. Well, he's R.I.P. to the legend. Yeah, yeah he's he had he's cite he had cited the the um monster man the D and D monster manual pro probably from probably from the rural cyclopedia days of of O D and D as one of his artistic influences. And if you look, if it's not as present in the anime, but it's very much present in the manga. 
Yeah, a lot of the old school monsters do have like a really creepy kind of cool, like it, it has a very unique style and they really moved away from that in the current Yu-Gi-Oh stuff. In the current, but also, also it's some, it's something that doesn't trend. One thing that doesn't translate easily from manga to anime is art styles that rely a lot on shading. I think this is why you do, why it's easier to do shonen um, in anime form than it is to do seinen. Because if you look at Makes the sense. if you look at the big four of seinen, you know you know um, Berserk, Vinland Saga, Kingdom, and Vagabond. Vagabond, which to my recollection, has not gotten an anime. They are all very, very detailed um, art styles. And some of that detail is going to be lost when you're transitioning over to color, unless you have a studio that really understands how to, u how to utilize shading like Mad Men, like, say, Madhouse or Wit Studio. Yeah, possibly my two favorite studios. Mm -hmm. I mean, Trigger's up there too, but <laughs> it's... Uh... Uh, Studio Wits uh, maybe my favorite. Yeah. Now, with with that with that said, social deduction games are are, cer are certainly nothing new. But given that given that this one is focusing far, focusing far more on the on the strategic ends. Oh. Walk me through. Walk me through some. Walk me through some of the some of the core aspects of the mechanics besides just the texting aspect, because that we've already well covered. Yeah, sure. So everyone's going to be playing their own character, um, which will sort of have their own alias, and they'll be part of a different team. Now, now here's here's one catch though. Uh, just like a lot of this reference is Death Note, by the way. I'm going to bring that up quite a bit because the. This game essentially is um, sort of like a reskin version of a fan-made Death Note game I made five years ago. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> um, and, and that that seemed popular enough where we had people asking, like, okay, can we like make this the full thing? And of course, I don't have the rights to Death Note, so I reskinned it. It's all my original, you know, stuff as far as that goes. Um, but yeah, so essentially, there's different factions that you'll be a part of. There is the Yakuza. There is the monastery, and then there is uh, the Baker Street Irregulars, which is sort of like Sherlock Holmes's mm -hmm. uh, lineage of people. And every player will be on one of those three teams, but their allegiance might not necessarily be to their team if they're the one that has the power of death that is killing people. But you don't know who has that. So you kind of are like working for your team, but you're also not sure if you have like essentially the traitor on your team. So you're also trying to work with the other team but you're not exactly sure who you can trust. Um, each character has three stats to keep the game fairly simple. Mm. You have combat, investigation, and stealth. Mm. Uh, combat is for any type of confrontation. Um, essentially, it's a contested role where whoever is highest will win the confrontation. You can join up with other players in a confrontation. So if it's two versus one, you will have a much better chance of winning that confrontation. So when it comes to sort of navigating... The game you might not want to go alone but if you also go with someone else there might be someone that you can't trust so there's a lot of um positives and negatives to every action that you make throughout the game because you you have to really weigh your odds of like okay is this someone that you think you can trust or not mm -hmm. um then you also have investigation which is your ability to learn new information uh, this is one of the key aspects of the game because it allows you to help learn what actions other people are taking, where they're located at, what they're doing, um, what sort of uh, abilities that they may have, things like that. So you can start piecing together this information. And so you're not just making wild accusations and guesses. You're actually s starting to figure out like actual information that you can like use to start narrowing down your options and start actually solving the mystery. And then stealth is your ability to sort of avoid confrontations and to avoid being investigated. So your higher your stealth, the more you can sort of stay out of the picture, where people that have a lower stealth are more likely to be encountered. Um, if someone are, is, is moving uh, about the game, uh, you're more likely to be found if you have a lower stealth. So all three of those stats are very useful in their own ways. And so, you know, there's different characters that are put into the game. So if people just want to jump in and play, they can play with one of our balanced characters that have a variety of stats and abilities, 
or you can simply make your own character, which is very easy to do within the game system as well. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, since you mentioned that there's going to be three stats, given how this game given how this game is played primarily through text, um, how are those stat how are those stats going to be coming into play? Is it going to be a case of using a randomizer or is it more, is it more of a diceless affair? Where does it fit in that spectrum? So all the encounters and interactions and roles is handled by the game master um, to make it fair, you know. So hopefully the game master isn't cheating to to you know have a bias towards a certain player or another. But essentially the game master will take each person's stats, they'll roll it, and then they'll determine the outcome based off of that. And it uses a D6 system, which they can use in person, or they can use like an app to roll the D6. Um, so, so far, all of our RPGs are D6 systems, so we just kept it in line with that. Mm -hmm. that, cer that certainly makes sense. And, it's, and it, sounds it sounds like you, ha you have just one guy acting... Well, di well GMs are, are going to be referees, is what, is what I was about to say, but... That bring that brings me to the within the book itself, which I do f I do find interesting that you're going with a um te a tarot kind of si kind of sizing setup. Uh. Yeah, yeah. So it worked out for the the rules are fairly short for the game. Like I didn't need a whole lot of pages. Um and uh for those following Vindicated, we have sort of this like signature manga. Uh, box that we've been using for like a lot of our latest games mm -hmm. and so it allows us to fit everything we need into that box and it, we have all the rules there so it just seems like a, a good fit and the tarot card size like it, it kind of feels thematic as well yeah and within that particular within that particular set you have you have th you have um four different types of cards calamity character location and skill and i'd be curious how, how each of them is going to play a factor in pl well play yeah for sure so character cards that's essentially like your pre-generated characters that if you want to use you can or you can use those as a template when making your own character However you want to use them, you can split it up or, you know, however you want to do with that. So there's a there's a handful of those characters in the game that you can just jump right in and have a full game uh, to play with those. And it's also helpful just to have them already, like, on reference since you just have them on hand. Um, for your skills, uh, those are essentially, like, nice references that you can use where it has the different abilities on each card. Um, they each tell you what the name of the skill is, what the effect of the skill is. And if it's neutral, dark, or light, mm -hmm. um, because if the skill is more dark or light oriented, it can uh, have an effect on certain other factors. Especially if death is the one that like chooses you to like have the power, uh, you're more likely to have it if you have more dark oriented skills. So if you start learning about a player and you learn that they have like a dark skill, they might not actually be bad, but <laughs> so it could actually be sort of like a red herring. But it does give you a clue that they're more likely to be. Uh, aligned with death, for example. And maybe that's something, maybe if you're aligned with death too, like maybe if your allegiance is to them, then that's a good thing for you, but it's something to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. um, for the locations, uh, that helps keep track of where the different players are at any given time. Each of the three factions have sort of like their own headquarters where they all start off at and where they sort of return after their basic actions are done and where they can talk among their own team so that's like the main spot that people are, but occasionally people will want to meet up at like a neutral location or they'll want to move somewhere else or do something. So having those cards will like help keep that in line whenever you're running the game. It's not something that's like necessary to have, like you don't have to have the cards, but it definitely helps as like a reference tool. And then last but not least for the calamities, that is a built-in system where throughout every single round the calamities will start occurring. So, like, so the first calamity will be like a, a general effect that will take place, and then after that rounds over, it goes into the second calamity, and basically the calamities keep stacking until it just builds up and, and more and more and more. And so it works as a as a way of pressuring 
the game to go into a, a finalized state because it, it makes it so players can't just like sit on their thumbs and not really take action. It, it sort of like forces the game to keep moving forward. So there's always stuff happening and keeps it from being stagnant. And at its final conclusion, the very final calamity is uh, like a mob that basically starts forming up and they feel allegiance to death and then they start growing in size and they get more and more powerful and then death can send the mob after like their adversaries and just start like running over the headquarters and attacking attacking you and the rest of your people and even if you can fend them off they're going to keep getting stronger and stronger and stronger until you can't fend them off anymore so you're very much incentivized to try to solve this mystery solve the case and arrest or or stop death by any means necessary uh before it gets that bad mm-hmm I suppose I could like. I suppose I could liken the calamity cards to the uh, bomb under the table, as Hitchcock c- described it. So I'm not familiar with that reference, but that sounds. I mean, it sounds accurate to me. Uh, it was some. It was something he co- he um coined, or rather, or rather was co- was coined at, was going after him after the fact. When he was talking about how to add t- add tension to a scene, and yeah, the idea of a bo- of a bomb under a t- under a table is a bit extreme, but he was he was putting that in in there to show that that little change can cr- make a scene more tense than it already was. Because it was about how do you make a how do you make a dinner conversation in um interesting, and that and that was his response. Okay, yeah. If you have a bomb under the table during a dinner conversation, it immediately gets more interesting. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Yeah, like for those listening, if you're not familiar with what I have done with Vindicated, I actually like one of my biggest, uh, I guess, philosophies or like one of the biggest mindsets I have when it comes to game design is I personally cannot stand any tabletop game or video game or just basically any activity that feels like a slog, that feels drawn out, that feels like it is taking forever or it's just like very monotonous that is like the biggest thing that like just destroys my psyche i just cannot deal with it like even any job i'm doing i need it to be i need it to be changing up i need it to be like adapting i need i need it to be like i just can't have it be the same thing over and over so i really try very hard with any game i design to make sure that the game is constantly like up to something new it's like it's like a good movie like if you're watching like a really well crafted like well written movie the whole time you're just like sucked into it because it's constantly progressing forward. It doesn't mean that it necessarily has to be going at like a, a blitzkrieg pace, but it just, it, it's at least moving in a way to where you're not just sitting there looking at your watch saying like, Oh geez, like what, when is this going to just move to the next act? Like what's going on? And so I really like, that's a big factor for me with my game. So that's why we have the calamities in this game. So it's constantly escalating that tension. So even if at the very beginning, people are kind of like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing or this or that, like it's going, things are going to happen, whether the players like push for that or not. Now, luckily, because the game is pushing that in itself, it, it does encourage the players to make actions and take moves and to push the narrative forward themselves. So it actually is like a way like you're not just relying on the players like the game is actually there to assist them in that way and not just like not just assuming the players will just take that up on their own it's like there to help guide them in that direction and not to get too off topic but it's like that with other games I've made too like I have a card game called Gulatine and like essentially as you're moving up the tracker if it goes past 13 you're out and so the attention immediately begins as soon as the first card's played because that card will adjust that number and a lot of the numbers get adjusted upwards so as the number is moving up it, there's immediate tension about it going past 13 or i was in the temple before for black paper moon and that one has a dice tower mechanic uh, known as the die tower and essentially you start stacking dice upon each other and if the die tower falls over, then a character dies or something really bad happens. So you immediately start like feeling that pressure and that tension, and it's t- and it will definitely move the game forward, no matter what. So that's just very much like a core aspect of like what I try to implement in any of my games. Mm-hmm. And I I do remember having some back and forth about how the dice tower could be implemented in virtual tabletop, which would be in something like tabletop sim, it would be tricky. <laughs> Possibly even <laughs> yeah, harder. and for those listening, if you're interested, uh, there is a, a, ver- a rule variant that changes the dice tower into 
more of like a, a giant death roll where you roll a bunch of dice uh, mm-hmm. all together. So there's like a way to do it. It's not the same. You're not building the tower, but you know there is a way to sort of like still play online. Uh, so you can still play Black Paper yeah. Moon online if you want. Yeah. Now, you had mentioned the factions, so I suppose that's as good as good of a spot to go into next. There's three factions that you that you mentioned: the Baker Street Irregulars, the Monastery, and the Yakuza. And I think this is as good a time as any to go into the skinny and why th- and why they have their particular relationship with um, death. Yeah, sure. I think that's a great question. So let's start with the Baker Street Irregulars. Uh, like I said earlier, this is Sherlock Holmes's sort of like lineage of people. These are the brightest minds across the world. Uh, they're all the smartest people and they they all have like their own quirks and stuff but they are known for being the, the most intelligent and so when this m- murder mystery essentially starts happening whenever uh people just start dying all of a sudden uh in droves and people can tell that there's something up and they need to solve the mystery then they sort of take the place of i guess you could say like L from death note mm-hmm. where these are the th- there's no better like group out there like this is your top tier people and so they essentially like it's like well this is the biggest murder mystery of their lifetime so it makes sense that they're going to have to take up the mantle and then try to solve this the best they can Hmm. so their their involvement is probably the most straightforward and easy to understand um then next we have the yakuza which you know they're they're um Japanese gang that they want power. They want to. They want to. They, they see that uh, somehow, in some way, someone has the power over death. And any group that wants to be powerful, if they see this. It's like, oh well, how can we learn about this, and how can we wield this for ourselves? Mm-hmm. So a lot of it deals with that, and then them be- being involved. They're not afraid to get their hands dirty. And they have a lot of connections, so they're able to sort of get into this game um, in, a, in a whole different way. And then last but not least, with the Monastery, um, they think that this is something sort of beyond our world, something a bit more supernatural, something that may be related to heaven and hell or something more like faith-based. And they see that they see this as a, some sort of sign that they need to look into this and um and in and, and in particular this isn't just a random monastery this is one uh the amakusa monastery which is based off the um he's not technically canonized but he's sort of like a, a saint of sorts in japan uh for shira amakusa who has a very he's a historical figure with a very interesting story that i recommend anyone look into mm. but essentially he was uh, spreading Catholicism in Japan, and uh, someone that he was leading betrayed where his whereabouts were, so they were essentially jumped, and then uh, they were like massacred and stuff. But he was like a young faith-based guy. That very interesting story. Anyways, uh, so th- this group's essentially um, based off of him and his legacy, and they think that this has something to do with their beliefs, and so they want to be involved uh, dealing with that. Um, now, depending on the size of your game, you might not even necessarily have all three factions playing in it. You might just play with two factions, but that's depending on how many players you're running and how you want to play it. But those are why those three factions are involved. And the three and, and the different uh, pre-generated characters, uh, they also have their own stories like put in the game too, so you can at least read like how they're involved. And if you want to make your own characters. You can base it off of them or sort of like in relation to like how those characters are. So they give you like a nice sort of like footing into the world and like why they're involved, why each of those characters are involved and who they are. Mm -hmm. And given, given that I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up that within the description of the Yakuza on the Kickstarter page, there's the implication that that particular br- that particular branch that particular family is in a bit of a civil war that is true yeah yeah so essentially they lost their leader and um the the main guy in charge and then there's two half brothers that are sort of vying over power uh one of them is a b- bit more 
cold and quiet, and he's not necessarily very vocal about being at a war. So the the other one just sort of like has taken charge, but the other one might not necessarily be happy with that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, so yeah, there's sort of a uh, a rivalry of sorts that's going on with that, uh, and then they have like a younger sister as well, which uh, it can be very interesting in a role playing narrative. Uh, to to have this like these two brothers that and, and what's cool is like the players can sort of decide like how the story plays out too you know so it could be that in in your game you might have it where both players playing the brothers um, might just be aligned on the same faction so even though they don't get along like maybe they both are just trying to like figure out who death is and put a stop to them and maybe by the end of your narrative and the end of your story they end up getting along they become friends and they solve the case and things are good. Or maybe it turns out that they, they find out their little sister is the one killing people. And then maybe one of the brothers uh, protects her and the other one tries to go after her. Or maybe they all three end up working together. Or, you know, like there's so many different ways it can play out. And what's cool is you can take sort of the, the narrative that's already there, but you get to build upon it in whatever way that you want to. But it also, it's not solely based on you, like any good tabletop RPG experience. It's, it's you plus the other players. So even though like you might play it a certain way, depending on everyone else's actions and how they're playing it, that will also change your story and how that narrative plays out. Mm -hmm. And with the, with that in, with that in mind, uh, I'm guessing, I'm guessing that even, is this going to be a situation where it's relying on pre-gens or, is there going to be the option for people to make their own characters? You can definitely do both. Um, you can definitely play a whole game where it's nothing but pregens. Uh, I think the pregens help sort of establish sort of like the idea that, like at least in my mind, as to like, okay, well, this is sort of like the this is sort of like how I see the story and like where the different sort of like points of reference are in the characters and sort of how each faction is. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, you could either make your own characters to fit in with that narrative that's kind of already there, or there's rules to make your own character and you could just make your own story. Like you could just say, hey, the Yakuza, like they're trying to be the good guys. They want to redeem their name. They want to kind of be known as this organization of like charity or something. I mean, you could you could spin it however you want and you could play that game however you want as well. And and also what, what can be fun, too, is if you run this game multiple times, uh, especially if you're running with similar players, you can change it up for them, too, so that they, I mean, their experience will already be different based on how everyone plays each time anyways and how the everyone's roles and what everyone gets is. But um, you doing subtle things in the background as the game master to switch things up will definitely, like, will, will definitely have a massive impact and change the way the game plays. Yeah. And with the, when it comes to the skip, when it comes to the skills, um, since it does sound like skills are going to be freeform, do you plant? Are you going to be putting in a bit of a um, example list so that so that things don't get full um, wushu open essentially? Yeah. So actually, the skills currently in the game are very much the opposite of that. Like they're very non wushu. <laughs> they're very, they're very. Uh, so in, in Black Paper Moon, they're they're a lot more like freeform, mm-hmm. uh, sort of like the wushu thing that you're hinting at. Mm-hmm. Um, but in Death Sins, uh, what what's the opposite of wushu? What what term should I use? Um, well, w- wushu opens skill skill system was. Ex- was the furthest extreme of freeform. You you could put in anything as a skill. Um, yeah, so what's the opposite of that? I'd say the opposite is something a bit more structured. Okay, well, th- I would say in this, it's very structured. It's very much like, here's a list of skills. Mm-hmm. Here here's the, here's the skills in the game, and here's what everyone can have. And it's even to the point where you can see the list, and people could essentially go, oh, well, I know that this player will have something off this list. I mean, it's almost like a uh, like a board game in that way, where you, you, you like you know the the options that they have at their disposal. So it's not like you'll encounter someone, and then it's like an anime where it's like a plot twist, where it's like, oh, wow, he can control fire. Like, I, I use a grenade to try to explode it on him, and he just, like, is manipulating fire and shooting him. It's not like that. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, I, mean, I suppose if the person running the game wants to throw in some abilities and like really throw people off, then that's something they could do. But the game's definitely set up to be a lot more structured. Yeah, I can, I can, I can certainly get that. Yeah, I'd say because of the system too. Um, like if we're going off of the, the sort of the triangle for for tabletop RPGs, where you have like narrative, you have like gamist, and you have simulationist. Mm-hmm. Uh, this one's a lot more like simulation based, whereas like Black Paper Moon is more narrative based, and then Other Worlds is more gamist. Yeah. And for for what is for what is worth, I I. I don't I don't mind that whole narrativist gamers and simulationist thing although I do I do think I do think the original text um, made made the unfortunate mistake of acting like you can only be one of those three yeah um, and 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 obviously like I don't think either of us believe that no and one a dear friend of the show Joel Clark absolutely hates GNS theory for that exact reason. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, it's tough because in in our space, there's so many different topics and 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 different things, and it's 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 kind of like tricky to navigate like how to bring it up or talk about it sometimes because it's like everyone has their own opinions on things. But yeah, I'm just trying to like communicate, I guess, whatever works easiest for people to understand. Where it's like, okay, well, with Death Send, it's definitely not Wushu. It's very structured. Um, and then Black Paper Moon, it's a lot more like everyone's on a team, and you can like have like very much freeform abilities. Yeah. Now, with that in with that in mind, when it com- when it comes to fac- when it comes to faction and allegiance, faction we've already covered, but is allegiance is, is that where the whole um, dualism regarding light and dark comes into play? Yeah, so with your allegiance, um, essentially that will sort of determine uh, your your like goal that you'll have. Mm-hmm. Um, because you might be part of the Yakuza. Well, let's say let's say you're part of the Baker Street Irregulars, but you might be the person that's been given the power of death. And so like your whole team's like, oh, we gotta solve the mystery, figure out who death is. Well, obviously you're gonna be trying to throw your team off because they're essentially trying to discover who you are and put a stop to you. Mm-hmm. They just don't know it's you. So that's where that comes into play. Uh, essentially you have death and you win if you can um, f- kill uh, Sherlock. And Sherlock is the designated title for, it, it doesn't mean it's actually Sherlock Holmes, but it's like the person that's appointed as being like, the the main person on the case mm-hmm. uh, who's trying to like solve the mystery, um, and they win if death is arrested, um, and then Sherlock is automatically given twelve investigation as like a stat boost um, to like help them out, um, and then there's also X death, which is someone who like works as the hand of death, and they're able to communicate with death uh, directly in like a private chat, mm-hmm. um, so they they have like their partner in that way. Um, but yeah, so so it's almost like there's like two different layers of teams going on. Mm-hmm. That certainly makes sense, and I'm ge- I'm guessing that so- that some of that will be noted on e- on either the sheet or a ca- or a character card regarding the regarding those kind of um, overall goals, especially since it's the kind of thing that can be that can fit into a bullet point. Yeah, so on the uh, pre-gen characters, because I didn't want it to be solved where, like, we say, okay, well, Noah's always death, and then, you know, Yuma's always Sherlock. It's like, well, if you played the game more than once, you'd always know that. So the character cards themselves don't state that, because that's something I wanted to be able to change independently of the characters. Um, That way it can always be different whenever you play, and it also just changes the way that story unfolds. Mm Mm-hmm. Especially since I th- correct me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the things you're going with is that any ca- any character in theory could be de- could 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 um be tied to death. Correct. Now I need to sort of double check something because I do know that whoever gets the power, I know that it's it's determined at random, but you have a higher chance of getting it the more dark skills that you have. 
and at least to the pregen ca characters, they each have two skills associated with them, and then they get a random skill to always change the way the game's played as well. Mm -hmm. And so that also can make it so the percentage chance of any of the pregen characters also isn't always the same. So you can't like game that in that sense either, where you're like, oh, well, this guy already starts off with like X amount of dark skills, so he's always going to be the most likely, so we're just going to gun for him every time. Since there's always that one random skill factor, it also changes like the percentages of who could be death as well. Mm -hmm. And given that, and of course, given that it's randomized, this is going to be something that the GM is going to be rolling. Yes. So the GM will know all information at any time, uh, as typical. And so they will be the one that will basically figure that and appoint who, who's death. And it also happens with X death as well. So even if you can figure out who has more dark aligned skills, um, even though that doesn't guarantee that they're even affiliated with death, or you could think that they are death and it could be X death. So Because acting as the hand of death, Mm -hmm. They one of their ploys could be that they want you to believe that they are death. So if you use all your resources and all your actions, all your time to go after them, they could lead you on essentially a wild goose chase. Uh, while whenever you finally confront them, you arrest them, or you know you take care of them in any way, uh, it turns out that they're they actually were doing that all intentionally. Mm -hmm. uh, sort of, so, sort of the equivalent of a kagemusha. Um, hmm, that I feel like I should know because that sounds very familiar, but I but I'm I'm drawing a blank. Kage Musha or a Shadow Warrior was some was sometimes a double that would act, that would act as a given feudal lord in order to throw the scent off. Okay, cool. Yeah, I do know that Kage means shadow in Japanese, so that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's essentially what that role is. And the way that they want to play that could be up to them. I mean, they could both try to stay in the shadows and both try to, like, just try to wield all that power and do what they can. Mm -hmm. uh, or they can do it uh, that way, which would work as well. Yeah. And when it comes... When it comes to the when it comes to the overall setup, because of the fact that it's built on social deduction, have there have there been have there been cases where in playtesting th things ended up ended up slowing down because of an obstacle that hadn't been overcome yet, or is that not something that can re that is as easy to happen in this system? I haven't seen there be a problem with uh with they're not drawing to a conclusion mm -hmm. um the only the only issue that i really have come across sometimes is just like when players first begin the game like the very first round uh or maybe the first two rounds depending on the player they might be a bit more like okay i don't really know what i'm doing this is very new to me um and they don't really have like a good grasp on the game at that point and so you know, people might just sort of be sh like shooting in the dark and not really. It might be sort of like aimless, just because it's like a new concept and they're not used to it. But as far as like the game, like having a conclusion, um, it definitely seems to like move forward, like in a way to where it doesn't seem like it's not like you you'd be playing for like a while and then just people are just sitting there like I don't know what's going on, I don't know what to do. Um, it because also like as like because. Death is killing some of the players as the game's progressing, and as that's happening, I mean that that in a way starts narrowing down who this could be, anyways. Because if you're playing with like you know seven people, and then three of them are dead at this point, and there's four people left, and you know that you're not death, then you know it has to be one of these other three. And then like if you've been investigating people, and like you learn certain aspects, and stuff, like you will eventually start being able to whittle those down to someone at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes, um, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I am very aware to people, too, that this is a very different concept for a tabletop-type RPG. I mean, not only do you not have to play at a table, but the idea that there's, like, player elimination and that there's, like, there's like a traitor and, like, it's not... You're not all cooperatively working together. Uh, I totally get it. I just like to do things that are different sometimes, and I know it's not for everyone, but I at least like the idea of putting this out there for... 
for people that want like a different experience to like because it actually does feel like you're playing sort of like in that sort of death note story and to me like this is the best way to capture it where your actions are secret and there is someone that might be on your side or you think that's on your side but they're actually not and they're trying to mm -hmm. be against you that makes sense now I know that the core book is going to be light, but what? Are, but um, what are you shooting for as far as the page count of it? Yeah, so it's looking like it will be forty pages, if I'm not mistaken. Which I was I was guessing around thirty, so I wasn't too far off. Yeah, I mean, keep in mind it is tarot card size, so it is a small book. But yeah, we're looking at. I, I'm going to try. I think forty pages is the limit that they allow me for the book. Um, so essentially, I'm just trying to make sure I, I want to try to have as much information in there as possible. But if there's any extra pages, I think some of the pages just have like art on it and stuff, just to just because I have that extra room to like work with. But yeah, I, I believe it's currently at 40 pages, with some of that being artwork. Mm -hmm. That certainly makes sense. And. I will and I will certainly be keeping an eye out ho on how it develops. Um, and congratulations on me on meeting your funding goal. Um, Thank you. What would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Yeah, so the game is pretty much done. Um, thankfully, <laughs> I'm gonna have to comb back through it just for edits and and make sure that everything seems to look okay. Because um, like for for example, uh, it was going by a different name. Uh, it got change to death send uh a little bit before the kickstarter uh so i need to make sure that the inside the book it doesn't refer to the old name and stuff like that so i hope i catch all <laughs> catch all that um if someone's uh watching this video and they see something in the book that says white abyss that just know that was the old name uh but uh, i like death send a lot better anyways um release window um so the kickstarter will be over this month um we're looking at printing this through the Game Crafter, which I've used before. They've been very helpful and easy to work with. Sometimes they can take a few months before they actually print and send off everything. So, um, I don't know. I think on the Kickstarter, I, I always try to put like a date that is later than what I think it will be, because I'd rather try to be early than late. Um, but I would say sometime during the first quarter of next year is what I'm thinking it will be. Um, but I think on the Kickstarter, I put something a little bit later uh, just in case, like I th let me look at it. So it says June twenty twenty four. I think it will be out before that. I just mm -hmm. I I put that just in case because sometimes you know complications can happen. Um, you know, unfortunately, like, like with other worlds, that was like my uh, latest delivered game. <clears throat> I've been pretty good about being on time with every other game, but other worlds, I had some complications pop up, and so I was a little bit later on that one. But um, you know, still got it out there. And it's it's shipped out, and now people are receiving it. So everything's good. Mm hmm. And I, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. You're very welcome. It's always great being at the temple. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>